If you've listened to Brewlosophy at all, you know how much we love Imperial Yeast. The company was founded on the ideal that if you're going to do something, do it right. From their Imperial Pitch Right pouches, packing a whopping 200 billion cells of healthy and viable yeast in each pouch, to their commitment to commercial customers guaranteeing 10 of their most popular strains are in stock for orders up to 20 liters, or the shipping is free, Imperial Yeast does it right. No more worrying about whether you need to make a starter or propagate your yeast prior to pitching. Imperial Yeast makes it easy for the home brewer and commercial brewer to obtain direct pitches at proper rates when you need it. To place a commercial order or to get more information about everything that Imperial Yeast has to offer, head on over to imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. We're lucky to brew in a time where the vast majority of ingredients available to us are high quality. We've got great maltsters, yeast labs, and hop suppliers, but occasionally things out of our control impact the quality of those ingredients when we go to brew with them. Like, for example, when a wildfire is burning near a hop farm causing smoky hops. So what do you do when something happens to the ingredients that you're planning to use, but those ingredients may or may not be tainted? Well, I'm your host, Cade Job, and today I'm back in the lab with my co-host, Jordan Folks, as we talk about last week's episode, Smoke taint in hops with Brandon Sandoval and also discuss using tainted or old or odd ingredients in our brewing practices. Yeah, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? We want to make sure that we use the best quality ingredients possible. But especially on the homebrew scale, you know, it's like, oh, man, I've got these hops sitting in there. They're 10 years old, and I really want to use those before buying a new bag. And so the temptation to use questionable quality ingredients is there. Uh, And then not to mention just, you know, you go to some, you know, rinky-dink homebrew store, and they've got a bag of uh, T90 pellets in a trash bag, and they scoop them out with a cup, and you know, the, the quality of the, um, from the source can vary too. And so, uh, we've got a lot of experience brewing with questionable quality <laughs> ingredients and, uh, it'll be fun to kind of do a bit of a meta analysis again to see, uh, what shakes out. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good thing that we have so much experience brewing, <laughs> you know, with, with those poor quality ingredients. Uh, but certainly a lot of experiments that Brewlosophy has done looking at that stuff. And for breweries too, sometimes you get in a bind, right? I mean, if either, especially if you're a brewery that's on a hop contract, you know, you've got to be using those hops regularly and if you get behind you need to be selling hops or potentially if you get ahead you know buying hops from the spot market all these things are questions and concerns but let's be real there are times that all of us have done something to mess up the quality of their ingredients right and and um it for me at least um that has vastly outnumbered the times that like they've just shipped to me as poor quality ingredients like for example smoky hops in fact i don't think i've ever actually been shipped a sample of hops that turned out to be smoky or, or um, I've never been sh- shipped or picked up hops from a homebrew supplier that have turned out to be smoky. But that has happened to commercial brewers. It's something that the industry is looking at. And of course, that's why Brandon did his research there. And at Brewlosophy now, we've done a lot of experience looking at tainted ingredients, be they old, be they stored warm, be they just weird. Um, and so Jordan and I thought it'd be a good idea to use this episode to talk about those experiments and how we approach using tainted ingredients in our brewing. And maybe this will give you some ideas if you ever get some um, smoky or smoke-tainted hops. If you're not already a patron of Brewlosophy, please consider becoming one. We really appreciate the support we get from our patrons. And as a reward for your support, you get access to unpublished contributor recipes, discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session. Becoming a patron is easy. There's no obligation. You can cancel at any time. But if you're out there listening to this show and uh, reading the content on the website, watching Martin's uh, Brewlosophy, Philosophy Show channel on YouTube, listening to the Brewlosophy podcast. All of this stuff uh, is available to you for free, and we really appreciate our patron support for uh, that help us make those things possible. And as a reminder, all of the previous uh, Patreon monthly live Q&A sessions are available to you on the website, so you can still access all of that stuff by becoming a patron. All you need to do is sign up at by visiting patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Another great way to support us is by using those links at brewlosophy.com slash support. There's some really cool affiliates who do give us a small kickback if you purchase from their site using one of our Brewlosophy links. It doesn't change any part of your shopping experience, but it does help us out. So head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to check it out. Now for this week's feedback, listener Finn wrote in. He says, hi, and thanks for producing a great podcast. There was one thing I think you didn't mention in the episode applying the science about controlling attenuation, and that was limit dextrinase. Fair enough, since normally it doesn't do much, and I guess that was why you skipped it. But I think you can get an effect 
out of it if you're willing to do a little extra work. To do its job of cutting up the limit dextrins, limit dextrinase needs a low pH down towards 5, uh, I think, and a temperature between 60 and 60. Two and a half Celsius, so that's somewhere in that 150 or um, 140, 150 range uh, Fahrenheit. None of which you would normally aim for. The ideal would be uh, to first get the temperature up to 65 Celsius to get full gelatinization of the larger starch granules, and also give uh, the alpha amylase a high enough pH to work efficiency efficiently. Let's say you hold this for about 15 minutes, you would then have reduced most of the starch to fermentable sugars and dextrins, which in practice means limit dextrins. If you've held back a little of the mash water, you could now add the rest cold to lower the temperature to where the limit dextrinase wants it. Add a little acid along with it, and the conditions ought to be perfect for limit dextrinase to go chopping up those dextrins. I don't know what would be the optimal time for this dextrin chopping rest, but perhaps 15 minutes would be a good starting point. After that, you'd have to raise the pH again. A pinch of sodium carbonate would do the trick or whatever you prefer to use for this. And you could then go on to whatever temperature intervals you like. I might go for a short rest at 67 and then continue to 72. I've tried this a little, though I haven't perfected it. It's given me three or four OG points, but I think I might get a little more. Uh, by now by, <laughs> by now means a revolution. Uh, or Sorry, by no means a revolution, but at least measurable. I brew a lot of Pilsners, and that's the only beer I consider using this little trick for. I'm not that hung up on maximizing attenuation when brewing other other styles. Writing from Norway, Finn. Yeah, this is interesting. I hadn't heard of this in this context, but uh, it reminds me of a brew trick I've heard for lager brewing in that a common step mash typically starts with 144 degrees Fahrenheit, and I think that's 62 and a half C or so. And um, there has been concern that you're not actually at a gelatinization temp yet. And so one trick from lager brewers that I've heard is the coast down, where you mash in at like 149 or something like that, and then change your temp control to 144 and just let it naturally fall down back to 144 F during your initial beta amylase rest so that you ensure gelatinization. But then you hit that sweet spot that really encourages attenuation. Um, I hadn't heard about modulating the pH low and then ramping it back up to like more like 5.4. Um, I believe it. Um, but yeah, so uh, super interesting comment and definitely something to think about if you're trying to brew dry beers you know, mash low. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you bring up a, a really interesting point there, Jordan, that we always, you know, sort of think of a step match as, mash as starting low at that protein rest and then raising up, right? Uh, but we never do like a trickle down, right? We never do like, here's gelatinization um, and then let's go back down. But I think largely because if you think about it in the past, before there were thermometers or anything, hitting that number or whatever to reach gelatinization, um, you weren't really able to tell. So if you went too high, you denatured all your enzymes and you're done and then you get no beer. Um, so I'm wondering if that might be an interesting way to start doing st uh, doing things. Now, I, I think the other point here, too, is like Finn points out, limit dextrinase it probably isn't going to do a whole lot more than alpha and beta um, because limit dextrinase, as I understand, still works on the same linkages that alpha amylase works on. Um, so you, uh, so you need a different um, linkage in the starch uh, in order to make it make your wort a lot more fermentable. Um, so limit dextrinase, while it will help a little bit, isn't going to do a whole lot because it's working on those same connections that alpha amylase um, would be would be breaking anyway. But that's a little too far in the science. Um, uh, but uh, if you have any questions about that, let's sh shoot me an email. And I hope I got that right about that uh, alpha and beta linkage. Anyway, after this short break, we'll be back talking about identifying and using tainted ingredients in your brewery. The dry yeast revolution is here and Cellar Science is leading the charge. Cellar Science has expanded the world of dry yeast far beyond the drab landscape of yesteryear. With over 20 strains of beer and wine yeast now available, you can brew any style. Not to mention that their unique growth and harvesting process greatly increases lipid levels in yeast cell walls, removing the need to aerate your wort on the first pitch and allowing you to directly pitch without rehydration. Couple that with the other advantages of dry yeast, such as higher cell count and viability, and you can clearly see why commercial breweries across the U.S. are using dry yeast and choosing cellar science. Before Shopify, were you wondering, where my sales at? Now you're selling with Shopify, the global commerce platform supercharging your selling. You have no problem selling online, in person, on social media, and beyond. Gary, easy on the cha-ching. 
<clears throat> oh, sorry, but my Shopify sales are through the roof. Start selling with Shopify today and discover how millions of businesses around the world use Shopify to ignite their selling. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash listen. Shopify.com slash listen. Yo, bro, you think you know ball? You gotta try sleeper picks. Just pick more or less from your boy's stats and you can cop a stack for real. If you think he's going off, pick more. If he's about to lay some bricks, take less. Is it Dame time? Use Sleeper's alternate pick for him to score 30 plus. Is someone in Philly gonna choke because it's the playoffs? Take less than all their stats. And Sleeper's even got your back with FlexPay, so you can still cop a smaller stack if one of your picks misses. But that ain't even it, Chief. If you're new to the game, Sleeper's gonna double your first deposit up to 500 bucks when you use my promo code CONTEST. No cap, you just gotta download Sleeper now. Madheads are loving this app, and it's time for you to get the bag too. Just use code CONTEST to make sure Sleeper hooks you up with a $500 deposit match. That's promo code CONTEST. Must be 18 years old. Promo code, location, and other restrictions apply. Deposit match bonus issued as is non-withdrawable playthrough funds. See terms of use for details. Please play responsibly. Call 1-800-426-2537 for help. Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston are springing up cash. Just sell us your gently used warm weather styles like tees, shorts, sandals, and more. We're paying cash on the spot for gently used spring styles for guys and girls. Support sustainable fashion. This spring, do your thing and recycle the spring-inspired clothes, shoes, and accessories that are just hanging in your closet for cash on the spot. Let your spring clothes bloom into cash at Plato's Closet. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. When new ingredients arrive at your brewery or home, it's important to inspect them, which could be as simple as reading the, ins the spec sheet or more thorough, like running tests to make sure that they meet tight specifications. There's a wide range of what you can do to make sure the ingredients you use are good enough to be used in your upcoming brew. Now, I'm curious, Jordan, do you regularly inspect your ingredients when you get home? I do try to remember to smell the hops. And so I'll, you know, rub the pellet or whatever between my hands, try to create some heat and then smell it. And if it smelled really, really bad, I probably wouldn't use it. Luckily, through yakimavalleyhops.com, that pretty much never happens. I don't know if it ever has with them. <laughs> but, you know, yep. 10 years ago when I didn't know any better, I definitely probably got some pretty old hops. But when it comes to <laughs> yeast, I mean, what are you going to do? Look, at, You could look at the date, but you're not like... Sm you know, tasting the yeast with your finger, right? And <laughs> yeah, right. And malt, sticking it in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, malt, you know, look at it, make sure there's not a mouse running around there. But um, it, there's, you know, at the homebrew level, without any sort of analytic equipment, you're really all you have is your senses in front of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a good point, right? At, at the homebrew level, there's there, you know, it really is kind of like trusting your supplier. And that is a, a, an important part, right? It, it, in the case of a homebrewer, that's your local homebrew shop or, you know, wherever you got your ingredients from. If you got it from a friend's garage, you better hope that your friend was storing those things appropriately, right? But if you got it from the local homebrew shop, at least this day and age, like you said, Jordan, I, I, I've never um, gotten home with something that I bought from a homebrew shop that was bad. Okay. Um, you know, that, that's never actually happened to me. More often what happens to me is I put it somewhere or do something to it. And then I come back to it six months, a year later, and I'm like, oh, I forgot I had that or I forgot I bought that. And most often hops that just sit up in my hop freezer and I buy like a pound because Yakima Valley Hops has some amazing special, right? Some amazing deal on like Citra that's going for like, I don't know, 12 bucks a pound or, or 15 bucks a pound. And I'm like, OK, I'm going to buy a pound or two. And then I realize that stuff's going to sit there for a long time or worse for me. It's the bittering hops like Magnum. I think I still have some 2019 Magnum um, that it, this is 2024, by the way, um, that I just never used all of. I used it for a good like a year and a half or two years and then got some fresh Magnum and I'm still using that now. So I, I think I, I, I still have these ingredients um, sitting around. But to the extent that you are interested in making sure that your ingredients are quality. Um, one of the things I always did with malt, just because I actually like snacking on malt, um, while it was milling, I just grab a little bit off of the top while it's milling and then chew on it while it's milling. And it, if it tastes great, I always assumed it was great. Things that you would want to look out for, in addition to mice in your bags, are like mildew and gross, you know, things that like this malt bag was not stored appropriately. Now, that's never been a situation where I've gotten that from a local homebrew supplier, but those are things to sort of look into and watch. But the key here, like you said, Jordan, 
is there's not a lot that you can do as a home brewer in terms of inspecting your ingredients. You can read the spec sheet. You can look at the date stamp on the outside of the package. Um, but you can you can look at the alpha acid, the reported alpha acid on hops. But it's not like you're going to measure that at home, right? Uh, um, and so sometimes that can kind of lead you in a lurch. I mean, there are lab tests that you could do if you have access to lab equipment. You could get a microscope and do some yeast counting um, if you want to do that. That's not terribly difficult. Uh, most of the tests can be done with a most of like even like alpha and betas can be done with a spectrophotometer. Um, so there are tests you can do, but just I, I really don't think homebrewers are doing that all that much. No, I mean, maybe there's some microscopes in some basements out there. Uh, I've got a buddy that, that got one for Christmas from his wife and, you know, has probably used it twice. Uh, it's just like it's a hassle. Right. And and, and homebrewing, you know, we're trying to make great beer and there's various levels of rigor that go into it. But it's just hard to bust out an entire laboratory on a brew day. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And I think even for small breweries, this is difficult too, right? I mean, like if you're a big brewery, like if you're Sam Adams or if you're Sierra Nevada or if you're, I mean, especially I'm sure, you know, Bud Miller Coors, I'm sure those those big breweries, every time a lot comes in, they're probably doing their own analysis on it to check and make sure that that it has the specs that they need for brewing. But even like small, small scale brewers, right? I mean, local brewers, like most of the brewers in Portland don't even have a lab. So they're not going to be testing these ingredients. Everybody's sort of relying on... Um, um, you know, what people say or what people think or what's printed on that spec sheet. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because, again, like I said, we've got really quality suppliers these days. I always this was before I started brewing, but I always heard those stories, um, uh, you know, back from like the Charlie Papazian days in like the 90s. Um, and whenever they, would, they talked about like, uh, you know, oh, I got this yeast and it just didn't ferment at home or, oh, I got these hops and they smelled like cheese um, and I just couldn't brew with them. I, it's I, I don't think that has ever happened happened to me where I got it poor from the supplier. Um, and But, you know, there are lots of things that you do with your your ingredients that potentially cause issues. Like what happens if I store my hops and, you know, and don't vacuum seal them? What happens if I just brew with my tap water versus, versus RO water? And there's all these questions. And that is one of the reasons I turned to brewlosophy so early because there was nobody, at least whenever I started brewing, there was nobody out there that was regularly publishing articles looking at this kind of stuff. And so it turns out Brulosophy he has done a lot of experiments on this, but I don't know. Was that also your experiment, your experience, Jordan, like reading brewlosophy articles to figure out if you could use old ingredients or not? I mean, if you want to know if you have something in your freezer or basement or whatever, that's been around a long time, I probably took a Google on it and brewlosophy was probably the brand that would have popped up first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there could have been other people out there, but that was the one that I focused on. And I'm not trying to like toot Brulosophy's own horn. I mean, I know this is a Brulosophy podcast, um, but it really was like this was the only outfit out there that was looking at things like, you know, if I run my water through a garden hose, um, is that going to result in chlorophenols in my beer? Right. Or if I store my um, malt in my garage, is that actually going to cause problems whenever I brew my malt? If I have old yeast and I make a starter with it, can I do that? Can I save yeast? And there weren't like, there was like oh, forums, right? There's like homebrew talk forums, but that's just a person responding in, you know, independently on the internet. Who knows if you can trust that person or not? Or who knows if they're even just a troll? Like, yeah, go for it. Just so they screw up your beer. I mean, I don't know. Um, Brewlosophy, though, was one of the sources that I trusted the most. Um, and it turns out, like I said, we've done a whole bunch of experiments looking at using, um, you know, maybe questionable ingredients is the best way to look at it. Um, so we're going to talk about water malt yeast and hops of course the four ingredients in beer um and we'll do it in that order since that's kind of the way it starts um in the in the brew house water malt hops and yeast i think i said yeast and then hops but water malt hops and yeast so jordan you want to kick us off looking at some of the water experiments sure so you know they've always said if it tastes good you can brew with it and um that's probably true to a certain extent if your water tastes rancid do not brew with that right and so um <laughs> yeah I think as we see with a lot of brewlosophy experiments, a lot of this stuff is, is effectively insurance. Um, sure, you might get away with using old yeast. You might get away with using old hops. But fresh quality ingredients are going to be a safer bet. So as I assume we'll see, there will probably be some cases where there was a not significant difference and they got away with it. But I don't think that that is gospel. It just means that in that case, uh, or in some cases, you might get away with it. But there are other times where it could burn you. And so I think that uh, when it comes to water, you really want to use reasonably good tasting water. Um, and so there's a variety of ways in which 
which you could get your water. And so uh, one such issue that a lot of uh, brewers around the country uh, have issues with is their groundwater, their source water, wells or um, you know city water, what have you. And some of them have problems with it and they actually need to use RO, maybe make it themselves, buy it from a grocery store. Uh, there could be a lot of chlorine, chloramines, etc. There could be tons of dissolved solids, uh, a variety of reasons in which you wouldn't want to use uh, straight water from the tap. So we compared RO versus tap water in an American pale ale, and we uh, did adjust with brewing salts to get a pale ale appropriate uh, water chemistry profile, um, and I'll read this off real quick. So um, they both had 12 magnesium, 36 uh, sodium, about 200 sulfate, and about 50 chloride. But the difference here was that the source tap water had more calcium in suspension already, and they weren't able to get that um, as a perfect match. So that one had 137 calcium versus the uh, adjusted RO was 90. And then the bicarbonates are pretty big difference there too. Uh, the uh, tap was 228 versus 90 in the RO. So uh, adjusted that, try to get as close as possible. But again, the source water uh, is different. And so there could be issues of chloramine, etc. And sure enough, tasters could not reliably tell a difference. It was insignificant. And so I think this is one of those examples of it really depends on where you are and what you're working with. Because if you had a place that had, you know, spoiled poison water, like Flint, Michigan or something, <laughs> We might not see the same outcome here, but um, whichever brewer it was that brewed this, their source water was clean enough that um, even though they needed to you know, adjust their brewing salts, tasters couldn't reliably tell a difference. Yeah. And so this one, I remember whenever we discussed this one, I was the one that brewed this. And I, I, I remember when we talked about it, we talked about like the limited impact of this because tap water is so local, right? Like my tap water is different than yours, Jordan. And we live, what, an hour and a half apart from each other, right? So we're brewing with totally different water. Um, you're on, I, I assume, Portland city water. I'm on a well um, outside of Corvallis. So, you know, there's a, the, this is, there's a, all this variation. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this experiment is like, is that that exact quote that you mentioned earlier. And I think that was from Charlie Papazian that said, if you can drink with it, you can brew with it. And I wanted to test that out because I wanted to see like, see like RO. Okay. That's the reverse osmosis. That's totally pure water. That's basically no dissolved solids. It's not totally pure, but it's basically, it's less than five PPM of any of those salts that we care about for brewing. Tap water has a lot of stuff in it. It has a lot of stuff. There's, there's like in, in my case, um, bicarbonates and calcium, um, which made it, like you said, Jordan, impossible for me to match the two waters. But that's what I wanted to test. I wanted to see if I'm running water from the pipe versus getting it filtered um, through a reverse osmosis filtered, can I actually uh, do those two waters? water sources taste different. And I wanted to control the other salts. So I wanted to control sulfate to chloride ratios, sodium and magnesium, because those things have been shown to affect uh, beers, even in small, uh, small differences. But calcium and bicarbonate um, were the two that I wasn't able to get to, which is just kind of a function of tap water. A lot of tap waters have high bicarbonates in them, especially if you're in, um, you know, hard water areas of the country. Um, so that high calcium and high bicarbonate level Made a lot of sense. But this all sort of stemmed out of like, okay, if we want to make sure that our water is good, how do we how do we do that? And uh, what a lot of brewers started to do was I'm not even going to brew with my tap water. In fact, if you brew with your tap water, it's gross. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to do that experiment. And one of the reasons is because people said you need to brew with RO water, RO, 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 and then build up from there. That's the only good way uh, to, to brew. And so we did some experiments also in, in that vein as well, starting Starting with straight RO um, and then and then adjusting it. So one was, can you brew without those brewing salts like sulfate and chloride, right? And and calcium because you're always supposed to have fifty. PPM of calcium. We did it um, in an, uh, a Czech premium pale lager originally. Um, so we did a, the straight RO didn't have anything in it. So it was less than 5 PPM of all the salts. But the Czech premium pale lager had 50 PPM calcium, 5 magnesium, 0 sodium, 60 sulfate, and 60 chloride. Uh, so it's like a one-to-one -one sulfate to chloride. And uh, that one came back significant. So you do need some salts, it would seem, um, at least if you're brewing a Czech premium and pale lager. Uh, and so this is like the purest water that you're going to get, right? Uh, um, um, uh, uh, short of distilling it yourself at home. This is the purest water that you're going to get. There's no residual parts, uh, residual particulate in it. And we wanted to see, can you brew 
beer with that. So, and, and, and what do you need to do to adjust it? So these are ways, these are like uh, sorts of things that, that where we worry as homebrewers about our water source. And it turned out that the straight versus um, the adjusted RO versus adjusted tap water was pretty much the same, right? Tasters weren't able to tell a difference. But if you just use RO, but don't add in those brewing salts, tasters were able to tell a difference, at least in a Czech premium pale lager. But there was another style that we also tested that same experiment in, Jordan. Well, before we go there, I want to push back on your interpretation on this because um, I'm curious if you can maybe pull this up while I'm talking to you. Um, I'm curious if there were any fermentation or attenuation differences because we've we, they say that minimum of 40 to 50 calcium is necessary for a healthy fermentation. Uh, and so if it, it could have been that the straight RO that was unadjusted had a poor fermentation and then thus didn't taste as good. However, we have shown time and time again that brewing salts have a dramatic influence on the perception of the beer. And so my prediction is that it wasn't a function of fermentation performance. Rather, it was simply the fact that one uh, was sharper, or softer, etc., due to the brewing salts that in affect uh, perceptions of mouthfeel, dryness, etc., Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, the there was a little bit of a difference in the OG of them. So the uh, the straight RO um, had a 1055 OG, but the adjusted RO had a 1057 OG. So a couple of points different there, but they finished at almost the same FG. So the the straight RO finished at 1014, and the adjusted RO finished at 1015. So it looks like they both attenuated relatively similarly. Um, so n not a huge difference um, in fermentation, but, but yeah, maybe like you said the actual presence of the brewing salts making it taste sharper or more round or whatever um, playing the difference there right and so we have a similar one where we have straight versus adjusted ro and a blonde ale um, and in this case they couldn't tell a difference uh, calcium uh, 55 and then uh, sulfate 72 chloride 59 um, and uh, that's a blonde ale and um but it was a single taster. Um, it was the brewer during COVID didn't share with anyone else other than themselves. And they only got it right four to 10 times. And so maybe if we had had a, uh, a larger pool of tasters, uh, we could have gotten a significant results there. But I think that um, at the very least, there is some uh, suggestive evidence that uh, adjusting your brewing water will have some sort of perceptive impact. Um, even if it's not necessarily demonstrating that you absolutely have to have 40 uh, ppm calcium to get a quality fermentation. Yeah, exactly. You know, and then it, a, a cool thing too was another extension of this. A brew club member um, went and did a uh, treated versus untreated uh, in a New England IPA. And so this one was interesting to me too because on those first two, you've got a Czech premium pale lager and a blonde ale, right? Which there's not a lot to hide behind there. So you would think if you're if you're going to test you know, um, water adjustments or water treatments. That's a great, those are two great styles to do it. But what about in a super hoppy um, um, in the IPA? And so in this one, the treated water profile was 111 ppm of calcium and then 100 sulfate and 150 chloride versus distilled water, which is zero, right? There are no dissolved solids in distilled water. Um, and so so that's, so that uh, again, um, uh, yeah, 111 calcium, 100 sulfate, 150 chloride to zero. And in that one, it was also not significant. So um, that one, they had 16 tasters. They needed nine. They got four p-value of 0.83. So it was not significant in a New England IPA. But I have a suspicion in this one that that sulfate and chloride and calcium um, wasn't doing a whole lot to change the flavor. So maybe it was exactly like you said, Jordan. There's a little bit of like rounding or sharpness um, that those brewing salts are adding in those light lager or blonde ale. But it's just not coming through with all that extra hop character. Yeah, it's just um, with I'm this is the one that's less surprising to me, although I'm assuming that there was some sort of impact just when blind. It's just not as easy to tell the difference. But um, maybe one more water one before we move on here to malt is the whole point of this uh, conversation was supposed to be more about tainted ingredients. I think the last ones uh, were interested about more like raw ingredients. And so here's an interesting one. It's um, ostensibly tainted water. So we tested hot tap water from the um, tank water heater versus cold tap water from the pipes. Now, uh, there is concern with tank style water heaters that there is sediment, rust, gunk in the tank. And so you would not want to use 
hot water with a tank style water heater, uh, you would want to heat that cold water with propane, electricity, et cetera, in your brewing equipment. And so, uh, again, this is a COVID one. So it was a personal uh, brewer that tasted themselves. And they only got it right four to 10 times, which is not significant in the, um, the test. So in this case, in an American stout, uh, it sounds like their hot water tank was clean enough. And it wasn't making a big enough difference. I'm sure if you dosed it with rust contaminant or something, you'd probably start to pick <laughs> something up. But they got lucky. And I think that's really a, uh, a reoccurring theme we've seen a lot of this stuff is you know, best practices are a good thing, but sometimes you'll get lucky and you can get away with some stuff. Yeah, you know, and even at, at commercial brewery levels, right? Commercial brewers drain their hot water, or their hot liquor tank very often and clean it out because there is, there's stuff that gunks up into the bottom of it, even at high temperatures, right? Where there's not like necessarily a microbe that's going to grow um, to taint your water. There's other stuff uh, that comes in with it. So this was a really interesting and yeah, um, uh, surprising. And then there were a couple of other ones, um, uh, you know, that that um, uh, I think we did. Didn't Martin do something with um, like plastic jugs or something like that, Jordan? I think think it was a short and shoddy brew i don't think it was an Ah. experiment but he had a beer that turned out gross and uh there's an maybe a episode of the show where him and um uh marshall are kind of like thinking about what might have caused it and um ultimately thanks i think to youtube viewer comments uh we're starting to think that it was actually related to storing his ro in those big five gallon plastic carboys for an extended period of time so martin was going to the grocery store and filling the you know blue plastic carboy jugs filled with water and then you know a month or whatever later using it and he brewed a beer with it and it tasted awful and um he has since installed his own ro water system and he's making our water at home and he's not having these problems suggesting that you can actually have leaching issues when storing water in plastic for extended periods of time. Additionally, you can also get leached plastic flavors from using crappy hoses. So if you're using a uh, garden hose to collect your water, make sure it is a high quality drinking water approved hose. I had a buddy that got, you know, $10 $10 hose on Amazon or whatever. Really, really fantastic brewer. He was the Oregon State Home Brewer of the Year a few years ago. He knows what he's doing. And he brewed a couple beers, and by the time they were ready to drink, they were awful, like drinking a cup of plastic. Sure <laughs> enough, we, we, he, we poured glasses of water from his uh, garden hose, and the water, glass of water that you poured from the garden hose had that same plastic contamination. And so uh, th- who knew, you know, so you have to have a high quality uh, water hose as well for, for um, you know, drawing your water from your source. Yeah, yeah, it's super important to do that. If you start noticing, noticing plasticky or Band-Aid flavors in your beer that's been sitting, that's a great place to start is in, is in looking at your hoses. So kind of the big takeaway there from water is that like, yeah, most water is going to be just fine, right? Adjust your water so that you've got the right brewing salts in there. But as long as you, like Jordan said, as long as your water isn't like putrid, then it's probably going to be fine. Is it going to taste different if you use RO versus, uh, you know, like a, a straight tap? tap water un- unadjusted right unadjusted ro versus unadjusted tap water yeah it's probably going to taste different because the tap water is going to have some stuff in it that the ro doesn't have that's kind of a question of preference but it does sound like hey yeah you can um use uh you know use water that as long as it's not putrid again as long as you're not storing it in plastic jugs or using crappy hoses so let's move on to malt these were some fun ones so this they we've done a number of uh, malt experiments well, and by a number, I mean at least three <laughs> of malt experience where we've looked at either using old malts um, or or um, storing them in interesting ways. So one of the first ones uh, that that, that uh, uh, some uh, experiment contributors did was using year old Pilsner style LME. Uh, versus three month old LME, which is also Pilsner style in a Pilsner style beer. Now that's probably really gross for anybody that's used liquid malt extract. The Pilsner one is pretty light. It's still kind of dark, you know, because it's liquid malt extract. But um, after a year, ooh, yuck. I can't even imagine what that looked like. Who knows what kind of like oxygen is going to be in that that's going to change that color. Um, And in the pictures, it was noticeably darker uh, after a year. So there was a huge color change, which makes you kind of wonder, is 
this even going to be worth brewing with? Um, I don't know how many people still store LME um, in their house, uh, you know, because the instructions for LME say store at room temperature, right? If you store it cold, it's actually going to harden and then you're not going to be able to pour it. So the instructions say store it in a cool, dark place. But for how long? Um, this is one of those things I've always wondered about. So in this one, um, it was actually very significant. The p-value was 0.0009. <laughs> they that 35 tasters and 23 of them uh, got it right, which is pretty interesting. And if you look at the pictures on the website, holy moly, there was a very clear color difference in the finished beer. Like one of them looks like kind of like a, a slightly more golden pilsner. It wasn't straw colored. It was like a golden pills pills versus an amber, <laughs> which is just sounds gross. <laughs> Well, you know, they say that shelf stability is a real problem for LME. And so one thing I've heard uh, is DME, dry malt extract, is a safer bet because it doesn't have the same shelf stability issues. However, if you can find super fresh LME, that is actually the gold standard for extract brewing. And so that's kind of the, the you know, the weight you know, the, the scales you have to weigh in front of you is, do I want to use something that's ostensibly lower quality, dry, but a high propensity for storage or something that if it's good, it's great, but if it's bad it's or if it's old, it's really bad? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, this is a big one for, for extract brewers, right? I mean, a lot of brewers keep DME on hand, uh, dry malt extract on hand for adjustments, right? I think almost, at least most of the brewers I talk to have a little bit of DME to make adjustments in the kettle if they need to. If you undershoot your gravity, then you can throw in a little DME and get your gravity up or whatever you need to do. Um, but but the, for, for brewers who are entirely extract, yeah, using liquid malt extract, that's what I used to use all the time. So this one was really interesting to me. Um, and then, of course, there was another one switching over to all grain brewers how many times jordan have you gotten grains from the homebrew store and then one either got the grains and decided to brew something totally different or got the grains weren't able to brew and set the grains aside and forgot about them uh i don't know that it's set anything aside it's more like get somehow i get like a pound of C20 or something for like at homebrew con. <laughs> and then like four years later, I'm like, I never really used this thing. Uh, <laughs> That's true. But, with, yeah. but yeah, it's more like specialty ingredients, right? Like Munich malt or something like that. I keep that on hand, but I'm not brewing Munich Dunkel all the time or Doppelbach. And so I go through the Munich way slower. So it's really the specialty grains that will sit around the longest, but I'm blasting through base grain. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the same with me too, which was interesting because we have experiments. We got an experiment looking at some specialty grains. Well, it's not an experiment; it's short and shoddy looking at specialty grains. But then an experiment actually looking at, um, you know, um, uh, uh, normal base grains uh, included. So let's do the experiment first, and then we'll talk about short and shoddy. So the experiment was six month old milled grains, um, and it was in an alt beer. So so these were actually these grains were milled at the home brew store and then stuck in a garage for six months and so Marshall actually did this when it was stuck in his California garage which was probably warm um, knowing where Marshall lives it was there for six months milled grains so I think I think universally most brewers would say don't brew with those ingredients but we did it for science Marshall did it for science and it came out not significant so this one was really surprising to me right and so this is one thing that before I had my own mill I was always sketched out about is I would uh, heat my strike water or at least fill the kettle and then go to the homebrew store and purchase the grains, mill them, and then come back and begin, you know, resume the brew day. So I would never be done before dark. Be and I live near-ish a homebrew store just a couple miles away, but just it is so nice having the mill at home and just I wake up and I mill and I, I, I collect my water the night before, um, but I still to this day mill on brew day. And so this was comparing six month old milled grains versus brew day milled grains, and it was not significant. And I'm not that surprised. Maybe if they'd been left open in a paper bag, you know, in a musty basement, maybe at that <laughs> point you'd start to tell a difference. Maybe 10 year old malt, milled malt would taste a difference. But, um, uh, you know, I think Sapwood Cellars doesn't even have a mill, or at least they used to not. And yeah, that's uh, Scott Janish and Mike Tonsmeyer's brewery. They're buying pre-milled grain because of their system and set up in lack of a mill. And so there are great brewers out there using pre-milled grain. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not surprised that you can get away with this. 
Yeah, I actually didn't know that mills were a fire hazard um, for commercial brewers. I didn't know this until it worked at a brewery. And that like to have a mill, you actually have to have approval and a permit and all that stuff from a fire safety perspective because it creates a whole bunch of dust. And with a spark, if that mill sparks, all of that dust could theoretically ignite and burn down um you know the places so it's kind of interesting uh to 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 hear that uh the and and so it makes sense and again like i said i i still know brewers that refuse to mill their grain the night before they still brew it the day of they just refuse they're like no i'm not gonna save that time i'm not gonna let my grain sit out overnight so this one was fun um we also did a short and shoddy brew using some stored specialty grains now these grains were actually two years old and stored on a shelf in a garage now, they were unmilled, so they hadn't been milled yet. They were whole grains, but stored in a garage for two years and used to make a wee heavy, all right? So this one definitely is what uh, what you would think um, would, uh, would really show some characteristics of age or oxidation or, I don't know, like something gross. Uh, but they had 20 tasters, and so this was a short and shoddy, not an experiment. There's no tea test on this one. But 13 of those 20 tasters rated the beer as a 4 out of 5 or higher in their preference testing. So uh, so over over three quarters, or I'm sorry, over two thirds of the tasters said that beer was really good. Um, and, you know, uh, whenever it was brewed with those two year old, you know, stored on a shelf garage grains. And of course, malty was the main characteristic that they found in a beer. The malty characteristic, not all that surprising because it's a wee heavy. It's not like you dosed a whole bunch of hops in there and hoppy would suddenly overtake the malt. But that was surprising to me that four out of five brewers or four out of five tasters uh, rated it as uh, or sorry, 13 out of 20 tasters rated it as a four out of five or higher. So, Cade, um, one th- I'm curious, maybe you can pull that up while I'm talking here, because I'd love to hear the grain bill on this one, uh, because I think that the what I've heard is when it comes to storing grains, that the real risk is crystal malts. And that, uh, and maybe crystal slash caramel malts, that those grains have a way worse uh, storage um, preservative potential. And that um, as those oxidize, you can make some really crappy beers. Um, and, and maybe that's one of the reasons that American brewers have gotten away from using crystal malts and IPA, American IPA. And, and um, Cade, correct me if I'm wrong here, is the concern with old crystal malts in that is that the finished beer oxidizes easier or, or shows telltale signs of oxidation more prominently? Or is it regardless of cold side oxidation that old crystal grains pr- uh, pose a risk? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's got to be some some sort of oxidation. I mean, I don't know for sure. I'm going to spitball here a little bit, knowing, but 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 cr- uh, crystal grains are essentially sugars, right? They're made sugar, and, and so like if you leave like chocolate or if you leave like a malt ball or a malt candy out, um, you know, and exposed to air, and then come back two or three months later, it tastes a little bit stale, right? It tastes like cardboardy or papery, and so I think that's the same thing that they're worried about with those caramel malts. Okay, so I'll read you the grain bell, and uh, but before I do that, I want to read what Marshall wrote um, in the uh, in the article. He said, back in June of 2015, a local homebrewing buddy named Scott uh, gifted me a bag of milled grain he'd picked up a month earlier. He explained he got too busy after picking the grains up to brew and was wary of using month-old milled grains. So he gave it to me thinking it might make for a good experiment. Uh, so he placed the bag of grains on a shelf. Marshall placed the bag of grains on a shelf in his garage, and that's where they remained until he decided to use them two years later. So these were milled milled grains. And here's the malt bill. We've got pale malt, um, about 44%. Uh, we got Maris Otter, 44%. Biscuit malt, 2.75, let's call it 3%. Biscuit malt, um, 3%. Caramel, 120. 3% Carapils, 3% uh, Crystal, 75. And uh, about uh, 1% chocolate malt. So chocolate, Crystal 120, Crystal 75, Biscuit, Carapils, Maris Otter, and Two Row. Okay, yeah. That, so that's probably a fairly reasonable amount of non-base grains, 12%. Um, you don't see too many styles that are too much greater than that. But, you know, compared to modern IPA, where it might be 1% or something like that, that's not nothing. And so that is interesting that those um, held up so well that long. 
Yeah, yeah, it's pretty surprising. So yeah, you know, um, pre-milling your grains, totally okay. Don't worry about using those milled grains. Um, at least, well, I should say that. I got to be wary about like prognosticating too, because that's my that's how I would um, interpret these as well. I'm not saying what you should or shouldn't do. But I, in this case, looking at these, I wouldn't be worried about milling with grains that are a year or, or, or old. As long as they're stored in a cool and dry place, there's no visible signs of mold or anything like that. All right, we'll take a quick break and then we're going to come back talking about hops and yeast and using those uh, tainted or spoiled or old ingredients in your brewery. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel. And Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high quality stainless gear. Like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow off, and it can hold up to 4 psi of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest priced all in one electric brew systems out there. And their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry and win up to 100 times your money right now. Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Hey there, I'm Dylan Lewis, one of the hosts of Motley Fool Money. Each weekday on Motley Fool Money, we talk through the business news you need to know and the stories moving stocks on Wall Street. On weekends, we dive into the industries shaping tomorrow and host the experts, authors, and executives that understand them. Tune in for insights, a long-term perspective on investing, and of course, stock ideas, plenty of them. To quote a listener, it pays to listen. Check us out and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. It's a fact of life that humans sometimes make errors. Ingredients could arrive at your doorstep tainted, or maybe you just forgot about that bag of hops or grain or brick of yeast, or you got it at a homebrew uh, conference and you just put it down and never came back to it. You're wondering what you can do with them now. So Jordan, I'm wondering how often do you try to brew with older tainted ingredients versus just throwing them away? Like if you find that, let's say that old bag of pack of yeast from a homebrew conference that's two or three years old and just been sitting up on your shelf, are you going to brew with it? You're just going to be like, ah, whatever, and throw it away. It depends on the ingredient. So um, if the yeast was expired, not going to use it. Uh, But if the yeast is pretty old and it's like a lambic culture that I haven't recultured in three years, you know, throw some D throw some word on it and it'll wake back up. Um, hops, if they're super old, if they've been hanging out at room temp for a long time, no way malt. I'm way less concerned about it. Um, but I think, like I said in the last segment, maybe crystal malt, I'd start to have some pause. So it's really ingredient specific. And I got to tell you, Yakima Valley hops has served me really well. Uh, I'm, very uh, adamant about buying the current crop year. And so, um, I don't buy older varieties. Um, and when using them, you know, they're always great. Uh, there's been one or two times that the bag ended up breaking the seal in transit somehow, and then it's puffed and, you know, smell them, rub them. They still smell great. Uh, that being said, I have had the occasional batch of bad hops and I don't know if they were ever Yakima Valley hops. And, you know, you brew with them once and it's not that good. And you brew with them twice and you're like, it's still not good. And you just got to throw them away. You got to learn your lesson. Um, but that's the thing about this product is you don't know until it's too late. I recently brewed a clear out the hot freezer IPA and brewed a, uh, (laughs) 
American IPA using all 2022 variety hops. I got to tell you, Cade, it was not as good as the quality of IPA that I put forth in my brew house here. <laughs> um, so, you know, we'll talk through some comparisons of uh, hop years, I think, in this next segment. But I am a strong believer in fresh hops. It's It really helps you turn that IPA from 10 to 11. Well, I'm curious too. Can you tell us? Can you, um, can you tell us how you uh, store your hops? Like it, when you are you're not you're not using the entire bag every time you brew, right? You so I'm assuming you're using some, and then some is going back in the freezer. Well, you know me. I'm doing the most paranoid method possible. So uh, when I get the hops, they immediately go into a deep freezer that's dedicated for hops. And sometimes I have fruit, uh, frozen fruit in there for uh, Lambic projects. And um, once they're opened, uh, they go in a vacuum sealed bag. And I actually then take that and fold it up and put it back in the Yakima Valley hops uh mylar bag or whatever it is so if i was to have a poor seal at the very least it's in that um high quality yakima valley hops bag also it's great because then you don't have to label anything and so then you just <laughs> know true. the bag and for our experiments you know we're always posting photos of the product and then that way it's already in the same bag so yeah i'm vac sealing uh you know sub zero celsius freezing temperatures uh really doing everything i can to preserve these hops as good as they can be and this 2022 crop ipa the keg just kicked about a month ago or so it wasn't gross but it was not a 40 plus point beer well and i'm wondering too this is my second comment or question to you is 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 that just because you used a kitchen sink approach on that like i just need to clear out let's just put all this in the beer so you had like i don't know two pounds of centennial and a dry hop or something uh is it because of that or no you expected it to actually be good uh i wasn't i was kind of surprised that it was as meh as it was but no it wasn't like 40 different varieties i think it was mosaic heavy um and yeah it just wasn't as bright and fresh and pure as fresh hops can be and so that's why i always as soon as those new crop years come out um i get online and i get new you know bags and anything that i've left i bring to the homebrew club and um, give it away for people that are willing to you know use older hops yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think I'm probably one of those people that's probably a little bit more willing um, to use older hops, depending on how they were stored. Stored like Jordan does in a vacuum sealed bag, I'm probably not going to worry too much about that. Uh, but I don't have a vacuum sealer, so I don't store my hops in a vacuum sealed bag. I, they just go back into the Yakima Valley um, um, Hops Mylar bag, and I just kind of squeeze out as much air as I can, and then just close it and go back into the freezer. Um, and so it, we do have a really good mix of these experiments. Um, looking at how storing hops and age of hops might actually impact. And there is there are mixed results, so listener, beware on this. We'll start then with one of the original ones, which was brewing with old Willamette hops. And so in this case, it was nine-year-old Willamette hops that were stored in a freezer, so never opened, uh, stored in the freezer. And in this case, uh, 21 tasters, only five were able to tell the difference of nine-year-old Willamette hops versus new um, Willamette hops. P value of 0.82 and then um compare that one though with old simcoe so these simcoe were 10 year old hops and again remember simcoe is one of those allegedly not as shelf stable varieties this was stored in a vacuum freezer until about two weeks before the experiment when it was opened for another brew and then it was vacuum sealed and put back in the freezer except during shipping. Um, and in that case, 15 tasters uh, tasted the beer, but 13 were able to identify the beer uh, that had the 10-year-old Simcoe uh, that had been opened a little bit. That's basically everyone, right? And so I'm guessing that the style for the Willamette hops was not IPA. And then the Simcoe was either pale ale or IPA is what I'm guessing. And maybe while I'm chatting here, you can pull that up. Because yeah, I'm you nailed it. You nailed it. The The style for the Willamette was blonde ale, um, right? And the Simcoe was American pale ale. And was the Simcoe pale ale dry hopped? Because I'm half, I am have to think that the quantity used and the application used is going to be relevant here. A blonde ale, you're not doing heavy whirlpool additions, right? Uh, it could just be a bittering addition. And I'm that is a brewer trick in the pro side is once the hops get old, they transition them to bittering hops. And so it's really when it comes down to your late additions that you want to mind your crop year. And so this does not surprise me that Simcoe, a fruity, potent variety, is going to taste like crap 10 years later. 
Yeah, you nailed it, right? I mean, this is one of the things that brewers use a lot. This is one of the reasons why Belgians love old hops, because they're not using it for their hop flavor, especially in Lambics, right? They're not, they don't care about the hop flavor that those add. Alpha acids are going to degrade over time, but you're still going to have some alpha acids even stored over the in the freezer for a long time. So if you're using them for bittering purposes, yeah, this is a great use. And you totally nailed it. So the, the, Will, the Willamette beer had no cold side additions. So it had, um, it actually had Magnum as a first wort hop, um, and then uh, to about 18 IBUs, and then the Willamette was added a 14 grams, so a half ounce at 10 minutes, and then 50 grams, so almost two ounces um, at zero minutes at flame out, flame out. But again. Uh, that's that's at flame out. So we still got a little bit of boiling and, and some stuff that's going to happen there. Um, and then it was fermented for a while. So it was, again, only two ounces at a flame out uh, that was added in that uh, blonde ale versus the American Pale Ale with Simcoe, which had Simcoe 12 grams at 60 minutes, 30 grams at 15, 30 grams at 10 minutes, and 30 grams at 5 minutes, plus 120 grams at dry hops. So that's basically four and a, I'm sorry, three and a half ounces um, in the boil at various points and another uh let's see four ounces no five another yeah four ounces at dry hop so we had almost seven and a half ounces of hops in that simcoe beer versus the willamette which just got like two and a half so way way different in terms of the hopping schedule and I recall that Marshall says that this is one of the worst beers he's ever brewed. <laughs> yeah. And he, it was apparently really, really bad. I think the only one that might compare to that in terms of things he's talked about is when he tried to grow up some yeast from a bottle and it was just a disaster. Um, and it, like maybe they were using like a wine strain for uh, bottle conditioning or something and it wasn't actually the source strain. So uh, yeah, I would never use 10 year old hops unless I was brewing a Lambic, of course. Yeah, unless you're doing yeah, a, a lambic. I would do it at this point just because I'm really curious because I do think there is a sweet spot there, right? I don't think you have to switch off your hops after every new crop year. That's just me brewing. Um, I, I I do think it matters how you store and how they're um you know how they're sealed if they're in freezer conditions versus refrigerator versus you know sitting out um open. And um, one of the reasons why I think that is because um this the is there are all there's all these stories about people who put their hops in the freezer and they open it up and it smells cheesy, right? Or their hops were sitting out at room temperature, even though they were vacuum sealed in nitrogen and they open it up and it smells cheesy. There's all of these things. And that's true, right? Isovaleric acid is a, de- is a degradation chemical and if you, or a degradation compound. And if you smell that, yeah, don't brew with those hops because your beer is going to taste cheesy. Um, and it does smell like that. Also hops discolor. They turn brown. They're not green. They turn brown whenever they're oxidized. So think about about like a, and, and so don't brew with hops that are that way. But we have a couple of other experiments. So again, the 10-year-old Simcoe Simco significant. Martin, however, recently did one where he used old Cascade. So he used 2017 Cascade versus 2022 Cascade, both of which had been vacuum sealed and stored in a freezer. He served it to 20 tasters, but only nine got it correct, which was not significant. Um, So this was 2017 versus 2022 uh, Cascade. Right, and that's actually the last episode of the Brewlosophy podcast from last week. So um, if you haven't listened to that, check it out, and they go into full detail. Um, But as he talks about in the episode, he uh, ultimately could get it right himself. Um, and it was, they were nine out of 11 needed. So not quite there. Um, and I think that he even had, it was like a professional brewer tasting panel that did this one. (laughs) Um, but you know, um, they, they stored well. Right. And so, um, it was only five year difference. They were cold vacuum sealed the whole time. Um, but he, he didn't say that the 2017 was garbage, but he was not blind to the variable, able to reliably tell them apart, but it was kind of slight that he said. Yeah, and of course, check out that Brewlosophy show video too. It's a great video and and uh, fun to watch. Um, so they did uh, some more of that too. Like speaking of hop year comparison, so Lupamax is that hop product that's supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, ideal or for uh, reducing variability between hop years. So it's a concentrated pellet, and ideally uh, would eliminate year to year variation because there is year to year variation. Hops are not the same crop year to crop year. So there was another experiment that we did looking at Lupamax in 2019 versus 2020 with Mosaic 
in a New England IPA. That one, 21 tasters, nine of them got it correct. So a P of 0.24, they needed 12. Um, so not significant. So that Lupamax product, at least in that one experiment, also not significant. And one other, talking about storage. Um, so uh, in this experiment, we stored Motueka in an unvacuum sealed baggie for six months versus stored vacuum sealed for six months in a freezer. Um, and so these were both stored in a freezer, um, one vacuum sealed, one not vacuum sealed. 16 tasers needed nine. Four of them got it correct for a P of 0 0.83. So there, Old Cascade in American Pale Ale, Motueka stored unvacuum sealed for six months, and 20. 19 versus 2020 Lupamax, none of those were significant. And I think that on all of these, they were all stored cold, right? And so that's what we know in the science is that there are two things that um, expedite staling, increased temperatures and increased exposure to oxygen. So in a freezer, uh, you're able to mitigate one of those really supremely. And so, and you know, also you don't just have your hops in a in a plastic cup open to the air freezer air sitting there for five years, they're in at least a baggie with the, like the, the lid closed. Right. So I would imagine that if we were to age, uh, you know, mosaic cops, you name it, uh, in a bag in your attic for just a year relative to something that's been frozen or frozen and vac sealed, you probably taste a difference. So I think that the freezer is really helping preserve these products. I, I would suggest, knowing what I know about um, about hops, I would suggest that even if you if you store those up at room temperature in your attic, even after a couple weeks, they're going to taste marginally. They're going to taste way different. Um, and and if you let stored it up there for a year, ooh yuck, those are going to be gross. Um, don't Just do that. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> unless, so don't, don't. unless you're making Lambic. Uh, or that, unless, you, yeah. unless you want to write an experiment article about it. <laughs> you know, you're welcome to do that too. Um, for science. For science. Um, or make a Lambic with it, like Jordan said. Okay, so those are our, our um, fun hop experiments using like old um, hops or, or poorly stored hop ingredients. Now, um, we've done a buttload of yeast experiments at Brewlosophy. And so there were a lot of things on here like, you know, w using different types of starters or pitching, you know, direct pitching and all that sort of stuff. I didn't want to go into those like traditional process related variables. I wanted this to stay like old or tainted or or ingredients that you may not use. And so we're going to run through a couple of those. There are a lot of other process related variables like like I um whether to do a direct pitch or rehydrate a dry a dry yeast, right? I'm going to skip over all of those and not talk about those for this episode, but we'll talk about um, maybe, for example, using an old yeast slurry. Um, and so this is um, an example of an old yeast slurry in a Vienna lager. So there was, it was Saf Lager 3470. Um, it was in its third generation. So it had been reharvested two other times. It was in its third generation. It was 14 weeks old, like in a jar in the refrigerator um, versus rehydrated uh, a rehydrated fresh pitch of Saflogger 3470. Now, in this experiment, Marshall made a starter from the 14-week-old yeast and pitched the starter uh, versus the rehydrated fresh pitch. So in this case, there was still a significant difference. 18 tasters, they needed 10, they got 9. Um, I'm sorry, not significant, but just barely. P of 0.067. All right, a P of 05 is our normal cutoff, but this was 0.067. Um, so not significant in this case, that third generation Saf Lager, uh, 14 weeks old versus a rehydrated fresh pitch in a Vienna Lager. Compare that to a, the subsequent experiment which was the same thing in a Munich Dunkel. So it's the same yeast, third generation Saf Lager 3470, 14 weeks old, but no starter for the old yeast. So in this case, it's just the jar that's 14 weeks old that's been sitting in the refrigerator, dump that into the fermenter versus a rehydrated fresh pitch. And again, not significant. In this one, 20 tasters, they needed 11 and got five. Uh, so that one was really surprising, just taking like reharvested old yeast and pitching that directly versus a fresh pitch, no, no significant difference. I'm curious, did he sell count or use a um, rule of thumb to estimate his repitched sell count? No, uh, no, it didn't, um, which is interesting, too. That's a good point about pitch rate, right? Um, I, this is also sort of a pitch rate experiment if we think about it in that way. But no, uh, no, uh, no, no sell counting or um, any of that. Cause it could have been that at fresh it would have been an extreme overpitch, but after 14 weeks, uh, the viability loss made it equivalent to a 
uh, dry packet of 3470. So, oh, yeah. uh, you know, um, a bit of a confounding variable in terms of the conclusion here. Uh, but I think that at the very least it suggests is you can repitch yeast. And so I repitch yeast all the time. And uh, I, as I've talked about in prior episodes, I do some rule of thumb cell counting and use online uh, viability calculators to figure out how much that is. And as long as the um, predicted number of cells in the jar that I'm about to pitch is reasonably close to the pitch rate that I'm going for, I'm not that concerned about the age of the yeast. Obviously, if it's four years old, it's going to be predicted to be zero alive yeast cells, and I wouldn't use it anymore. So, um, you know, back in the day, they said if it was more than two weeks old, just throw it away and start over. I think that we're, we have some pretty strong evidence that you can reuse yeast that's been sitting in your fridge for a couple months. Just, you know, in my opinion, take a look uh, at how many cells are in there. Uh, you know, like I said previously, for every uh, one milliliter of pure slurry, that's equivalent to approximately 2 billion cells. So if you have two bil- 200 milliliters, you have um, 400 billion cells. And then use a online calculator to discount the viability loss associated with the jarring date. Yeah, yeah, and and so this is an interesting uh, takeaway too from that one. Um, you know, you your yeast estimation there is is great, right? That that you point out like um, how much you pitch. And so in this case, it actually might have been more yeast that were in the the slurry than in the the um, fresh rehydrated yeast, right? It might have actually been a lot more in the slurry, depending on how much was actually pitched in. And interestingly, um, the sloppy old slurry, which is what Marshall called it, uh, fermented and saw visible fermentation two days earlier than the fresh pitch rehydrated yeast. So it was ready to go. It was primed. It was in its third generation. Um, and yeah, solve better, more vigorous fermentation. Well, the key here is that it was compared to dry yeast. And that is a known um, issue with dry yeast is they have longer lag phases than liquid yeast. And so I would assume that if he was using the old sloppy slurry compared to a fresh pack of imperial yeast, that fermentation performance in time would probably be more similar um, given the notorious lag phase associated with dry yeast. Yeah, well, and so this is something that was an interesting, um, interesting comment, uh, you know, too. Like, with the, there was um, uh, interesting of like, okay, what if we used old yeast in a uh, versus a liquid yeast, right? Like uh, a direct pitch of liquid yeast versus an old yeast. And so we haven't done, at least as far as I could see, an experiment that was just looking at direct pitching old liquid yeast versus a new um, package of liquid yeast. But I did find a couple where we did vitality starters of old yeast versus um, either a direct pitch or um, stored a uh, you know, uh, two different aged yeasts. So let me sort of back up and sort of explain that more articulately. So one um, in an English porter, we did a vitality starter of an old yeast versus the direct pitch of the same aged old yeast. So we haven't, again, we haven't done a old yeast versus new liquid yeast, but we have done old yeast in a vitality starter versus old yeast direct pitched. And in that one, it was not significant, which I find incredibly surprising. So a direct pitch of old yeast, um, uh, of same-aged yeast, uh, versus a vitality starter um, had a p-value of 0.41. Um, and then in an American pale ale, we did a nine-month-old a vitality starter of a nine-month-old yeast versus a two-month-old um, joystick. Um, but again, that two-month-old was just direct pitched. This is joystick um, in an American pale ale. And again, not significant. So it did seem like the vitality starters of old yeast were actually leveling things out or maybe... Um, in in the case of the same age yeast not doing a whole lot uh hey uh google is your friend i found one so uh in was this 2019 we tested uh exactly what you said that you couldn't find um and it's uh, a strong bitter using imperial pub um and uh one was a month old and one was four months old and uh it was not significant they both um the older yeast did attenuate less um initially um it took longer to ferment but they gave it some more time and ultimately they both finished at um 1008 um and the older yeast was hazier um but um so there was a clarity difference but sure enough it was not a significant difference when it came to blind tasters 
Ah, awesome. So not not significant. I'm glad you found that because Marshall would probably be screaming at us in the editing if we had gone through that um, and not found that episode. But either way, still not significant. So we have a couple of different um, uh, different examples of where using old yeast at least, you know, uh, what was the oldest one here? Nine months old, um, you know, nine month old joystick still worked in an American pale ale. You know, at least uh, beers that aren't or, or yeast that isn't super old from a liquid perspective, 14 weeks old in that Vienna lager. But again, that third generation uh, of harvested yeast. So yeast that's old, but not terribly old. Right. We're not talking about like year old or two year old yeast, um, th- th- especially like liquid yeast. But like you said, I'm kind of in the same of the same boat. If it's if the expiration date has passed, I'm probably not going to uh, brew with that yeast. I don't know if there's exactly a time period where I would st- I would say okay it's hit this point I'm not brewing with this but it's probably around the six month mark if we got around six months I said nah, I'm not brewing with this liquid yeast at least not without making a starter or a vitality starter or something like that to help it along well hey you know starters are your friend you know look at the estimated cell count if it's zero toss it but if it's if, if it's estimated to be 50 billion cells and you need 200 make a starter Um, But another critical thing beyond age of the yeast is the storage temperature. And we have a couple experiments here, and uh, there's actually one that didn't make it to your notes that I want to make sure that we cover. So uh, we have a couple examples here of yeast storage temperature. One was the yeast was stored three days at 95F, uh, that's 35C, versus your standard refrigerated packet of yeast. It was joystick used in a double IPA, and it was a COVID experiment, so the brewer was the only taster, and they got it right eight out of 10 times. That is a significant difference. So uh, they could tell the difference there. However, this one I remembered uh, was Marshall did a collaboration with Imperial Yeast. Ah, yeah, and, with Casey. Uh, mm-hmm. Exactly. And they had some yeast that sat around in his like hot garage for a while versus one that had been properly stored. And I recall Casey and Imperial was like, do not do this. This is so dumb. And sure <laughs> enough, um, there was a significant difference. Uh, and it was just enough to reach that uh, threshold. Um, however, um, I don't think that the ba- the other beer was like really bad. Uh, it says three tasters of 12 pre- preferred the cold stored yeast. Eight preferred the warm stored yeast. And one <laughs> said that they didn't uh, perceive a difference. They just got it right by chance. So uh, that is pretty freaking wild that stored warm like in his like hot laundry room or something still made beer that people preferred. Yeah, I, I remember whenever Casey and Marshall were doing this, Casey, uh, she was like, don't do this. She was like, this is so terrible. This is going to be a really, really bad, a bad idea. Uh, but but yeah, I, and I remember whenever these results came out, um, and I think Marshall and I talked about this on a podcast, that yeah, the, the tasters actually preferred. Uh, so it was not significant, or it was significant. I can't remember. It was. Exactly. Yeah, it yeah, was significant. Enough. Just barely, but the tasters actually preferred the one that was stored warm. Um, and so yeast storage temperature does seem like it plays a role. Now, there's another thing, too. We were talking about harvesting earlier, and this one was a cool one that Will recently did. It was using yeast that was previously used in a smoke beer to ferment a Munich Hellas. Now, this is allegedly exactly what the Sri Lanka um, Hellas is done with. It's not actually brewed with smoked malt. It is yeast that is harvested off of their smoked Merzen, which is uh, brewed with smoked malt. And then they use that yeast to ferment just a regular clean Hellas, like a Munich Hellas. So he put it to the test. Um, What if I harvest yeast from a smoked Merzen? Um, I harvest that that yeast and then I pitch it into a Munich Hellas and see if I get anything smoky. And in fact, he did. 20 tasters, um, 12 were needed for significance. So he got it. It was actually significant that pitching yeast that was used to ferment a smoked beer actually resulted in a smoky um, or at least an, a slightly off uh, Munich Hellas. Yeah, so there, there were interesting comments from the tasters on this one as well, too. So there were of the 12 participants that got it right, uh, three of them reported like 
liking the beer that was fermented on just clean yeasts. Um, eight said that they liked the beer that was fermented with the smoked yeast, and one had no preference. And Will, um, whenever he was writing his preferences, said that, that he loved both beers. He thought both beers tasted great, but he was able to taste the subtle smokiness um, that the smoked yeast beer uh, added to it. So this was a, this was a really interesting one to me. Using a smoky yeast to make a clean beer resulted in a smoky beer. Yeah, and I did this outside of an experiment. Um, I did a short and shoddy smoked beer and then did a short and shoddy Hellas that used the yeast pitch from the uh, original smoked beer, and it definitely imparted a smoky character. Uh, I will say that it kind of lagered out over time. Not like it went away completely, but it was way more apparent, the um, hint of smoke, Uh, earlier in the keg as opposed to the last pint Uh, but it definitely works and it's a really nice way to uh, impart a bit of smoke character honestly maybe using one percent smoked malt or something is easier so you don't have to brew two beers Uh, (laughs) but it's 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 a fun project and it really works well yeah, yeah, I like it. I love that uh, Sri Lanka Hellas. I think that's a really great, fantastic, lightly smoked, subtle beer. Um, I really enjoy that. So that was a cool one uh, for me. You know, I meant to say this in the smoked um, and the hops piece earlier, and I want to mention this now since we're talking about uh, yeast that's been tainted from smoke. Uh, a local homebrewer here, and he actually works at our local homebrew, uh, homebrew store, F.H. Steinbart, uh, Brian Haslip has actually produced um, some material for uh, AHA. The Zymergy Magazine a few months ago, and then also at the Homebrew Con in Portland a few years ago, he uh, has done presentations and articles on smoking hops intentionally mm. and oh, using those as an ingredient. And so check out that Zymergy article, and I think probably the presentation at the, at the Homebrew Con is online if you're a member. Um, but he has used smoked hops as an, a purposeful ingredient. And so that's an interesting idea is instead of using some smoked malt or some smoked yeast, you could actually use smoked hops. And I've never tasted one of his beers, um, but I, I, uh, I apparently it works. And uh, there is a bit of a movement uh, growing for smoking your own hops. Oh, man, wouldn't that be nice? If we're going to start to have smoked fi- uh, smoked hops because of wildfire, that would be great if there was a movement that was going for uh, for being able to use smoky hops. Well, we have one last experiment that we'll talk about on this episode, and that is using frozen yeast. Yes, you heard me correctly. Um, in this experiment, they used house yeast, um, Imperial's house, froze it for 39 hours in the freezer, so it was a solidly frozen, um, thawed it in the refrigerator before pitching it, and then uh, and then went ahead and used it uh, uh, in the in the the beer. And so twenty four tasters uh, had this one, and nine got it correct, which was a non significant p value. So this one was not significant. Now the, I remember whatever we talked about this one too that there were concerns that freezing yeast would rupture the cell walls, right? And it would break all the yeast, and so your viability would totally be shot, and you wouldn't be able to produce a good beer. But in this case, at least freezing it for you know a day and a half or so didn't cause any significant problems. I don't know what would happen if you froze your yeast for six months or seven months or a year or something like that. But in this case, freezing the yeast didn't cause a significant difference. And Kate, I'm curious, were there any attenuation differences? Uh, I will say that when I've had this happen to me, I've had um, Imperial packages uh, freeze because the you know little dorm fridge that I'm using was accidentally set too cold. I've had um, harvested slurry and jars accidentally freeze from the same issue, um, and I have used them to you know su- successful results. Uh, but I didn't do a side by side, so I'm curious if in that experiment, if they saw any sort of lag phase difference or any sort of attenuation difference. Yeah, so the OG was 1050, uh, but then the FG for the non-frozen yeast, actually they hit the same FG, which was 1009. Both of them um, hit the same FG. uh, And no notes about any differences in a lag phase. Uh, He says, uh, Phil says here, after 24 hours, I noticed the beer pitch with the frozen yeast was about uh, four degrees warmer, indicating a possible stronger fermentation activity. (laughs) But that's about it. Wow, I wouldn't have expected that. But yeah, I think that what this exposes is that yeast is hardier than we give it credit for. I mean, dried yeast is, they're putting like three-year shelf lives on these things now, right? So um, I wouldn't recommend storing your yeast warm on purpose. But, you know, especially if you have nothing to lose, you might make a great beer. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah he's, again, I don't think I would recommend doing any of the things that we <laughs> talked about today on purpose, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't store your hops on purpose, um, you know, age them. Uh, but it is kind of nice to know that if you have some of these older or potentially tainted ingredients, there are things that you can do with them, and it may not make as big of an impact um, as as uh, as you would think. Now, again, remember too, for home brewers, this is all fun for us, right? It's five gallons, it's twenty liters of beer. If the beer turns out bad it's not the end of the world um uh commercial brewers that are looking for brand to brand consistency might have different takeaways um in doing these and again like uh jordan started off the episode a lot of the things that we do as brewers is insurance and so this is one of those situations where we're kind of going without insurance going against the grain uh, to be able to continue to use that ingredient so anything else you wanted to talk about on this episode jordan you know continue brewing with what you got and as long as it doesn't look like moldy or something is seriously questionable, you could probably still make a decent beer with it. Yeah, I I agree. Well, of course, Jordan and I will be back in two weeks with our next Applying the Science episode. See y'all then. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer. Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy.